All right. Thanks for that, CJ. Interesting technical difficulties to start the show this morning. But let's just jump right into it here. Every socialist is a disguised dictator. That was Ludwig von Mises. Now, a little definition, of course, is appropriate here. When we say socialist, we mean people who actually want to socialize certain elements of society through government, through coercion. We're not talking about anarcho-socialists or people who just want uh, you know resources to be shared or want to run their homes or their families or their communities by voluntary things they want to call socialism. That's not what we're talking. We're using the common definition of socialism of a government system where ownership of the means of production is controlled in some way by the collective body. And what does that mean? That means by the ruling class. That means by the people in charge. And when Ludwig von Mises said every socialist is a disguised dictator, what he means is that anybody who wants to socialize anything that is to take it into collective control, is to uh, use the force of government to take ownership of something in the name of the people, what they are doing is indulging in the fallacy of central planning the arrogance of i can be in charge of you better than you can be in charge of yourself and this idea of anything being controlled by force or violence uh, called statism right statism the belief in in turning to government to solve our problems the state the institution of coercion that it is this is not a, 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 an ethical way to organize society People use this as an excuse, and even the disguised dictators who are well-intentioned, who call themselves socialists, all the uh, the Bernie Sanders supporters, the Bernie Bros. Okay, so yeah, I, I, how 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 can we how could I back up Ludwig von Mises here saying that every Bernie Bro is a disguised dictator? Well, I stand by Mises here. Now, out of naivete, ignorance of economics, wishful thinking, whatever the case may be. Lots of Americans have been tempted into supporting socialism. And it is by indulging their own disguised dictator nature, their own inclination to be a central planner, to make decisions for other people rather than allowing them to make them for themselves. That is at the heart of socialism, even for each one of those Bernie bros who says, well, if Bernie Sanders was president, we'd have democratic socialism. At least things would be a, lot, you know, a little bit better here in the United States. We wouldn't have the corporatocracy capitalism that we have today. Okay, so so there's a genuine intention there. There's there's a the desire to make the world a better place. But by politicians like Bernie Sanders, they have disguised your own nature as a dictator to yourselves, Bernie bros. Bernie is saying, look, there's a dictator in you. You know better than people. Then, then those dumb red hat wearing mag tards in Republican states, you know better than them. You can tell them how to run their lives. You can tell them how to live. But you know what? You don't even have to do it yourself. You can just vote Bernie. You can just support me. Support the Democratic Socialist. Uh, you can support the Republican. I mean, really, this is this is behind government isn't entirely. This isn't just Bernie Sanders. This isn't just the Democrats. I mean, you know, on a scale of zero to ten. You could say that as a benchmark point, the Democrats are, you know, like 10 out of 10 socialists. They want they want to increase the size of government. They want taxes to go up. They want socialized medicine. They want socialized defense. They want socialized retirement. And, and the Republicans on the scale of zero to 10 on socialism are nine out of 10. And they, 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 they get a nine instead of a 10 out of 10 because sometimes they pretend not to be socialists. But they're indulging in the same nonsense that Ludwig was so eloquently pointing out with this quote, every socialist is a disguised dictator. Another quote from Mises, the champions of socialism call themselves progressives, but they recommend a system which is characterized by rigid observance of routine and by resistance to every kind of improvement. They call themselves liberals, but they are intent upon abolishing liberty. They call themselves Democrats, but they yearn for dictatorship. They call themselves revolutionaries, but they want to make the government omnipotent. They promise the blessings of the Garden of Eden, 
but they plan to transform the world into a gigantic post office. Every man but one, a subordinate clerk in a bureau. The people who are running for president right now, I would, I was, I almost said against the people running against me for president. They're not running against me. They're running for their own. No, but the people running against freedom, anybody but me, I'm the only one running on an ethical platform of localization. Every other candidate for president right now. And by the way, I am in third place in fundraising among active candidates behind Cheeto Jesus and the kid sniffer. But why? Why is it that this is a unique platform? Every other person running for president is running to keep some socialized system going. We've heard from some libertarian candidates say, well, we want a night watchman state. Well, we want the government in response to coronavirus to have nothing to do with it except controlling information. Oh, so you want a socialized information? You want to put government in charge of, of how we figure out how dangerous a virus is? You want them to be able to control who gets to see what data? Like we have now Trump demanding uh, ordering i guess he doesn't have to demand he just orders that the cdc conduct deliberations in private but do you think it would be any better with a disguised dictator with an l next to his name saying well i just want a socialized defense i just want to socialize protect these are the most important functions in a society defense safety and you want to trust them to government every person running for president right now except myself is a socialist in disguise a disguised dictator who wants to socialize certain functions of government keep them in the hands of this centralized system now what is behind this this understanding that centralization is bad that we cannot have a a, a, a government takeover of any services whatsoever that they must be conducted by peaceful market cooperative means, not by coercive, violent government means. The, the, the idea behind this that, uh, that, that I learned about through Ludwig von Mises that is so, I mean, this is just, this is one of those things when you get this, it, it, it's like, oh, wow. You know, like, like a, a layer of propaganda removed from your view. Praxeology, a philosophical term meaning deed, action, as in praxis, and logia studia. Obviously, we all know everything that ends in ology. This is the theory of human action based on the notion that humans engage in purposeful behavior as opposed to reflexive behavior like sneezing and unintentional behavior. And this is why, you know, we say take human action with the Mises Caucus. Take human action, engage in deliberate, purposeful behavior. And this, of course, is an idea of very popularized by Ludwig von Mises. And that was how I found out about this. So the terminology, the, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reading from the Wikipedia page, origin and etymology, not that important, but from Austrian economics in the tradition of Ludwig von Mises relies heavily on praxeology in the development of its economic theories. Mises considered economics to be a sub-discipline of praxeology. And this is, this is, I, I love being able to go, yeah, there are bigger, more important ideas. Ideas can be categorized and structured and, 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 and organized into charts and things like this. And if you think about, and I, I love this because, you know, economics, you know, when we talk about dollars and widgets and, and corporations, it's almost like a, a sub-discipline of true economics, of the study of the flow of human value. We have the study of U.S. dollars, the study of fiat currency, the study of all the, the of, of economic propaganda. And when you see that, well, no, really, really, to look at economics, you have to include all exchanges of value. You have to include relationships and exchanges of time and love and energy and affection, not just exchanges of dollars and widgets. And then you go, well, what, what if you're going to study the flow of value as it, it relates to the human experience? Because we're not just talking about, you know, asteroids made of gold worth trillions of dollars floating through space or even in the, the minerals in the earth as yet unmined, we're talking about value that is perceived by humans and how we manage and organize and relate to that value, how we interact with our, our other human beings, you know, when, when we understand this and this idea of praxeology, 
of looking at incentives, how people respond to incentives is a much bigger and more important field of study. And it is so relevant to understanding government in terms of how people respond to incentives, right? These incentives, when we, when we look, well, hey, government's going to give out all this free money. Well, what's the incentive to work if you can make more money sitting at home on the couch watching Netflix? Yeah, basic praxeology explains the unintended consequences that we see from government by showing the economic incentives as understood in human behavior. So subdivisions of praxeology, in 1951, Murray Rothbard divided the sub, and Murray Rothbard, you know, obviously the godfather of the modern libertarian movement, divided the subfields of praxeology into the theory of the isolated individuals, as in Rousseau economics, yes, Robinson Crusoe, the theory of voluntary interpersonal exchange, uh, catalactics, or the economics of the market, which has these subgroups of barter, or with the medium of exchanges and with, with the currency uh, on, on the unhampered market, violent intervention with the market, and the effect of violent abolition of the market, which is socialism. I mean, anytime, you know, what is the market? The market is uh, a peaceful exchange. I mean, yeah, there's the market, that market, a market for this, a market for that. But but when we as libertarians talk about the market, you know, we're, we're talking, and, and when Murray Rothbard is, is, is talking about the violent abolition of the market through socialism, the market is peaceful exchange. The market is the sum of all human interactions that happen peacefully and voluntarily from individuals who see the benefit for themselves, who want to engage in free trade because they see that it benefits themselves. This really is, by the way, what I describe as the capitalist ideal of all human interactions being voluntary. This shows our potential as a species. What could we do if we got rid of the violent interactions? Because violent interactions are win-lose. Someone is denied their choice in opting out because they are forced by the violent nature of that interaction to engage in a way that they don't want to. Their consent has been removed. By the way, this is the difference between libertarianism and every other political theory is that we respect consent. We don't want any non-consensual relationships. We want all relationships to be win-win by choice of everybody participating. And if every relationship is win-win, there's this potential for the world, for all of human society to live in a free market where all relationships are voluntary, where everything is win-win. That's the world I want to live in. Not because I'm greedy for myself, but I don't want my neighbors to be starving and suffering. I'm happier. I am more secure if everybody else is happy and everybody else is taken care of. There's a dangerous, really anti-libertarian element of human psychology which instead of taking competition as how do I best serve my fellow human beings? Because that's what the market demands, right? The market rewards people who are creating value, who are doing things that people want and like and providing goods and services for the benefit of others. If you are not doing that, right? If you, if you are, uh, you know, not valued in the market because there's some, well, as, as, as Rothbard would say, a violent abolition of the market with socialism. It means that somebody is violently interfering with your ability to engage in free exchange. You are being forced into a win-lose relationship. That is, as Rothbard sums it up, violent abolition of the market. Now, is it abolition? Well, it's only abolition at the point in which no voluntary exchange is allowed. I don't think any government could really achieve that. If you want to use these terms in an intellectual sense, Socialism is impossible. Communism is impossible. By their definition, they, they, as, as an absolute system, they literally cannot exist. You know, it's like if, if they are a cancer on a body, it's like, can you have a human being that's made up entirely of cancer cells? No, you really can't. You have to have a healthy host body in order for the tumor to be able to exist at all. So uh, other subdivisions here that Rothbard laid out, the theory of war, the theory of games. And uh, this, is, this is so important to just understanding human behavior. So Ludwig von Mises said, quote, praxeology is a theoretical and systematic, not a historical science. Its scope is human action as such, irrespective of all environmental, accidental, and individual circumstances of the concrete act. Its cognition is purely formal 
and general, general without reference to the material content and the particular features of the actual case. It aims at knowledge valid for all instances in which the conditions exactly correspond to those implied in its assumptions and inferences. Now, just side sidebar all this quote for a second, because you know my background is in psychology, uh, and by that I mean I have an undergraduate degree in psychology. Uh, I did a lot of counseling with with uh, with youth, um, tra- uh, at risk youth when I was in college. Uh, I've done a peer support group for veterans with PTSD called Home Front Battle Buddies, and I, I've always taken my background in psychology into politics and into activism and into my communications and understanding people's motivations and, and where people are coming from. Uh, I think it makes makes me a lot more effective to understand how the human mind works to the degree that I do, of course. And this this basic understanding of psychology is something that I think I think libertarians would do well uh, to, to pay more attention to. Although start with praxeology, start with Mises is sort of like applied psychology, right? Its statements and propositions are not derived from experience. They are like those of logic and mathematics a priori. They are not subject to verification or falsification on the grounds of experience and fact. And this is a big element of you know, libertarianism. How do we come to the understanding that nonviolence is better than violence, right? Well, it's, it's, not, it's not that complicated. These are basic fundamental truths of logic and reason. And love, you know, this is it's so important that we understand what we are facing in terms of the fear being foisted upon us by government, not just right now in the coronaphobia crisis, but the underpinning governments throughout all the time, they have relied on fear. We must take strength from these fundamental truths that we know are absolute. We must be courageous. And real courage is not the violence of men in uniforms. It is not the explosion of hatred or anger in response to stimulus. Real courage is not an an emotional response out of desperation. Real courage is the triumph of your convictions of love and logic and truth and reason. And that is why praxeology, capitalism, Austrian economics, libertarianism, this is why these ideas are so important. These are the ideas that give us courage, confidence in our convictions to move forward and confront the state. Some more quotes from Ludwig von Mises that I want to share that I think are important in this. Historical knowledge is indispensable for those who want to build a better world. Now, one other point here. I guess, well, there, so I, a lot of a lot of what Mises has done in the realm of economics has looked at fiat currencies and the uh, you know artificial manipulation of the economy through governments. As he said, if you increase the power of money, you bring about the lowering of the purchasing power of the monetary unit. And this is the, a basic explanation of inflation, which we are falsely led to believe is price inflation. Prices go up. Not true. Inflation is the inflation of the monetary supply. More money in the system chasing the same amount of goods and services means that the purchasing value of your dollar and your back pocket go down when they create more money, whether it's through fractional reserve banking through the overnight lending window, through the Federal Reserve, whatever it is. Now, aside from the ethical nature of what I've always advocated for as a libertarian, specifically the platform of localization as a way to ease ourselves out of this centralized system is influenced by Ludwig von Mises as well. There is no means of avoiding the final collapse of a boom brought about by credit expansion. The alternative is only whether the crisis should come sooner as the result of voluntary abandonment of further credit expansion or later as the final and total catastrophe of the currency system involved. 
my platform has been described as a message to the American people in terms of we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. The easy way is to apply a solution as big as the problem. The easy way is to localize government and not try to keep this centralized system going. The easy way is localization. The hard way is to keep your head buried in the sand and hope that government spares you in its violent death throes as it desperately clings to power. As Ludwig said, there is no means of avoiding the final collapse. Now he says, of a, bro a boom brought about by credit expansion. Well, this applies to government itself. It is an expansion of credit, of authority. And it is time for this to come to an end. There is a practical way out of this. There is a peaceful way out of this. There is an orderly way out of this in line with these fundamental truths that we know from logic and reason and love inspired by Ludwig von Mises. That way out is localization. So that's uh, just one intellectual exploration, I suppose, of the background for this platform. And I want to say thank you both to the Ludwig von Mises Caucus and to Ludwig von Mises himself for bringing attention to these ideas so critical for human progress. Thank <laughs> you.